Okay. Good afternoon and welcome to Open Classroom. I'm Janet Gillow, Director of Professional Development for the Brown School, Washington University in St. Louis. So happy to have you with us for today's presentation. Uh, throughout this webinar, you are muted. Uh, we can't see or hear the members of the audience, but we do love to hear from you. The chat feature is enabled and please do feel free to send in your thoughts, your questions, your comments uh, throughout the presentation and we'll make note of them and, and bring you into the conversation later. I do want to add an extra reminder that just due to the nature of the topic today, sexually explicit content is going to be a part of the conversation. At registration, all of y'all confirm that you're 18 years or older, but I just want to remind you of the content and you may be at work, you may be at home, maybe do a quick look around and just make sure that everybody um, in your earshot is on board for the program today. Um, Open Classroom has been just a wonderful adventure for us. We started this, gosh, about, about eight months ago when we had to close our physical doors, mm -hmm. um, but it has provided a wonderful opportunity to connect our community. And we're so grateful that you're here today uh, to be a part of that. I'm joined by my co-host, Cynthia Williams, who's the Assistant Dean for Community Partnerships. Cynthia will be um, helping to moderate the chat and when we reach the Q&A portion of the program, uh, she and I will be representing your voice in the room, um, adding to the conversation with Susan. Uh, before we get started, I just want to also let you know some of the things that we have coming up. Starting on Thursday, we're kicking off a three-part series on adaptive coping and stress management for health and public health workers with Dr. Megan Keyes. Um, that's at 12.30 p.m. Central. Uh, really kind of our love letter to the people that are on the front lines doing the incredibly hard work of managing the pandemic and caring for so many uh, of our, our family members, neighbors um, who are sick, trying to offer some self-care techniques. So if you uh, fit into that group or if there's somebody in your circle who does, we, we just welcome you to come um, and, and be a part of community with us. And then we're back on um, Tuesday, a week from today, December the 8th at 3 p.m. Uh, Dr. Elijah Paint Seal uh, from uh, Yale University is going to be delivering a presentation, The Neglected Cornerstone of Global Health Capacity Building. Um, so that's going to be really interesting. All of those programs are available for registration. Please visit our website if you'd like to sign up. Okay, so today's program. Um, I, I'm super excited about this conversation and glad you're here to be a part of it. Dr. Susan Sturitz is Associate Professor of the Practice at the Brown School. She is the chair of our sexual health and education specialization in the MSW program. Uh, she's been conducting sex research and teaching sexuality courses for more than 20 years. Uh, she's been published in many peer reviewed journals and she's a past president of the American Association of Sexuality Educators, Counselors and Therapists. Uh, she's also just a heck of an interesting person to talk to with a depth and breadth of knowledge that is almost bewildering and an authentic passion for demystifying and destigmatizing sexuality. She's here to talk to us about the connection between social justice and sexual health. Please welcome my friend and colleague, Susan Spirits. Thank you so much, Janet. And hi, Cynthia. It's really great to have you. I look forward to this conversation and I'm excited to um, have the question and answer with you out there and, um, and wherever you are. So uh, I wanna thank you for coming to the uh, Brown School's Open Classroom. Uh, I use she, her, hers pronouns. And as you heard, my role at the Brown School is chair of the specialization of sexual health and education. So I, I wanna give you a really warm welcome. And I also wanna thank many of you who came uh, November 10th to hear Alok Vaid Manam talk about gender and outside the gender binary. That was another one of our, our talks. Um, so as you know, you're supposed to use the chat whenever a question arises. And my the title of my talk is, There is no sexual health without social justice. I am gonna disappoint you after that prelude from Janet. There isn't much explicit pictures here, but we have interesting explicit talk. Um, this is an important topic for me, the connection between sexual health and social justice. Uh, it's an important topic because sex is a template for all human relations. Sex gives us scripts for all our social 
interactions. How we have sex is how we treat each other in all other realms. How we, um, if we grab pussy, we grab elections. If we are fair to partners, we're fair to others and to nations. So I do have some learning objectives for us today. Uh, I want us to be able to define sexual health and social justice, explain what it is about humans that makes us need social justice, uh, and to discuss why sexual health requires both personal sexual self-efficacy and social justice. So we have a few definitions. Uh, it gets better, I'm sorry, but we need these definitions just to sort of think about the concepts that we'll be talking about. And is my paper making a lot of noise? Someone said, your paper will make noise. Um, these are concepts we need to talk about, socially just sex and sexually empowering social justice. Two different things, but really one and the same. When sexuality is socially just, is liberating, affirming, fair, empowering, and fulfilling. By sexual health, I mean a person's confidence that they will have the sexual experiences they want the next time they engage sexually. They, oh, it's just not having disease or violence, et cetera. But really I see it in a more behavioral way. It's that we have this confidence, if we're sexually healthy, we have this confidence, we can have sex lives that we value. And by social justice, I mean the combination of equality, freedom, and common good. So if you think about it, freedom, equality, common good. I kind of think they're the sexiest words on the planet. So my as we said, freedom and common good to exist. Equality, freedom and common good. Um, we can't have good sex without those things. Without social justice, a person would not even be able to count on having the sexual experiences they wanted. The next time they engage sexually, unless either they engaged in solo sex or their partners wanted exactly the same things they did. And the latter is rarely the case. So we have to negotiate to have mutual pleasure and we can't negotiate unless we have social justice. We could say that sexual self-efficacy also depends on sexual group efficacy, even if it's a group of two. Um, Sexual group efficacy is group members' confidence that together we can have the results we want the next time we engage sexually. So if you're a couple, um, that means that you need to have this, this kind of group self-efficacy. The sex therapist, Barry McCarthy, teaches couples better sex this way. He says to become good sexual partners, we have to negotiate a sexual style. And he has like five or six of them that he recommends that suits both of us. And this enables us to develop confidence that we can both have pleasure and intimacy using that style. So I wanna to talk to you about Bandura's self-efficacy theory. Um, Albert Bandura, who's the originator of self-efficacy studies is a psychology professor at Stanford. And he believes human agency is a key to flourishing and that social interaction is a key to human agency. We're not heroes alone, we do it together. According to Bandura's work, an individual prospers and grows as they engage in effort. with each other, help each other get better at we, what we are doing. Learning involves observing and interacting with other people. It's not just something we do alone. And Bandura teaches there are four sources of self-efficacy. Peer modeling, if Mary can do this, I can do it too, is the idea. Practice, we have to get good at what we do. So Mozart had scales. We have to practice sex too. Um, I know abstinence only folks don't believe that, but it is true. Um, and then expert coaching, and that's where sex educators come to help us. And then the fourth one is sort of surprising, but it's pleasure while learning. We have to enjoy the process and each other. So we're gonna be talking a lot about 
sexual health as self-efficacy. And that is, so I've told you about Bandura and his theories. So a few more definitions. Um, in thinking about how one achieves sexual health, so much depends on how we understand, you know, who humans are. What are human beings like and how do we grow and develop? So I adopt the relational cultural theory of Judith Jordan, as well as Albert Bandura's self-efficacy theory you just heard about, in order to understand human psychology as I think through the relationship between sexual health and social justice. We need sex education that aligns with our psyches, with our psychologies, with who we are. So Judith Jordan and her Stone uh, Center collaborators are the authors of relational cultural theory. This theory revises individualistic psychological theories that see human beings developing autonomy through separation and individuation. Judith Jordan and her collaborators um, claim that those notions of how we grow and develop are all wrong that they're patriarchal, competitive, and they don't you know, think about the nurturing side of things. Relational cultural theory psychologists see people as fundamentally interdependent, not working towards dependence, and needing each other for success in life and sex, rather than dependent solely on the results of their own efforts. If you think about having sex, you can really understand that. We really don't wanna have results just from our own efforts. Relational culture draws on current neuroscience findings to, to support views of humans as social animals who develop and flourish only within nurturing relationships. Neuroscientists say neuroimaging shows humans are wired for connection and that personal disconnection and social isolation put stress on them, interfere with optimal functioning, with ability to thrive, and can even reduce human longevity. Relational cultural theorists see mutual empathy and mutual support as essential components of human flourishing. Growth producing relationships, they believe, give us the interdependence and sense of community that make us feel safe and contribute to our well being. The following five good things, according to these theorists, result from mutually supportive human connection and provide evidence of good enough social and emotional relationships. And they are zest, a sense of zest, clarity about ourselves, the other, and our relationship, a sense of personal worth, the capacity to be creative and productive, and the desire for more connection. According to our theorists, disconnections do occur, of course, we have fights. Uh, Jordan describes the process of rupture and repair like this. Empathic failures are ubiquitous in all relationships. Thank heavens, I'm glad to hear that. If the disconnection can be repaired, however, stronger connections result. So it's sort of good because to have disconnections because then you make up and you're stronger than ever. You realize we can get through this. So for instance, if the less Power. The more powerful person listens empathically and is responsive, the less powerful person learns that she matters, that she can be relationally effective and can bring about positive change in the relationship. Persons not listen, responds with invalidation, humiliation, or violence. The less powerful person learns to keep that aspect of their experience out of relationship. They cease representing themselves fully in that relationship or authentically. So with that often necessary self-protection, the relationship is weakened, mutuality is lessened, and people often move into more chronic disconnection. We shut down and have the opposite of five good things. We experience a drop in energy, decreased sense of worth, less clarity, more confusion, less productivity, and withdrawal from all relationships. So how do sexual self-efficacy 
efficacy theory and the relational cultural model go together very well. They work together beautifully like lovers to give us a foundation for good theories for good sex, good living and good government. We learn from and with others. We stay in connection and when we have fights, we repair them in ways that make us closer than ever. So combining um, both sexuality, uh, combining self-efficacy theory, both Bandura and relational cultural theory psychologists list us for the kinds of relationships we need to flourish. People need equality, freedom, and common good that social justice ensures to provide a facilitating environment for building and sustaining both self-efficacy and interdependent, mutual, empathic relationships. Both require freedom from constraints to negotiate freely with each other, um, to get consent, and to repair any ruptures that occur. Both also require the freedom of social justice to assure that people can make the choices they wish about how they want to live. So now that we have our psychology and philosophy down, we can go forward. But first, I have to explain why we are going where we are, where we are going. And I'll tell you a little story about Virginia Woolf. In her 1929 classic, A Room of One's Own, Virginia Woolf, a British feminist author, advises activists to not waste their breath trying to convert disbelievers to their point of view by launching a logical argument. She points out when a subject is highly controversial and any question about sex is that, one cannot hope to tell the truth. One can only show how one came to hold whatever opinion one does hold. So I think that's good advice still today. I'll take Virginia Woolf's advice. I'll continue by sharing three professional experiences that affected my thinking and me emotionally that transformed my practice and wedded me to, pro to my professional mantra. There is no sexual health without social justice. Next, I'll reflect on how difficult it is to work to connect social justice with se sexual health because in Western society, talking honestly about sex is taboo and dialogue is necessary to negotiate socially just relationships. I'll share one tool for making such conversations easier, the Plicit model. So here's my first experience that shaped my whole philosophy about social justice and, sex and sexual health. Um, I had this experience while I was doing, um, I, let's see, I, it was, I hate to say this, I was not going to say this, but it would happen 50 years ago. So I was working as Director of Education and Training at the St. Louis Family Planning Council. That's an organization that doesn't even exist today. We were an umbrella agency that distributed Title X funds to family planning programs across a six-county area. The federal Title X Family Planning Program, which began in 1970, provides not only comprehensive contraceptive services, but also related preventive health services to low income and uninsured people at reduced or no cost. So it's really, really an important uh, service to people who can't afford uh, to pay doctor's fees and hospital fees, et cetera. Um, and although its purpose is to allow people to plan and space their children, Title X clinics and Fundy often are the sole source of healthcare services for most of their clients. So my job at the Family Planning Council was to take a look at each clinic's patient education programs and organize training for staff needing improvement or new skills. After observing many sessions while evaluating these clinics, I started noticing a process that I had known nothing about before. It was unfolding in clinics return visit patients. As they took greater control over their sexual health decisions, started protecting their health, their sexual wellness, started feeling entitled to sexual pleasure. They also started to make self-enhancing decisions in other parts of their lives. I listened to the stories of patients who faithfully paid return visits to these clinics. They reported breaking up with violent intimate partners, quitting dead-end jobs, 
entering training programs, starting to work on GEDs, choosing Head Start for their children, and more. At the time, they convinced me that when we can take control of our bodies, when we can take control of our sexuality, we gain amazing energy and agency that can help us build better lives. At first, I thought patient success derived entirely from the results of the positive relationship of sexual agency to total agency. Audre Lorde writes about the power of the erotic to transform lives. She's so true to me. I, I, she's really one of my favorite theorists. But I now think this does not give a complete enough story of growth. The myth of individual transcendence over adversity lets the rest of us off the hook. We do not need to help people who are successful in pulling themselves up by their own bootstraps. A truer story of individual success is bigger than its protagonist. The truer story reveals that individuals cannot make it alone. No matter how talented and driven we are, we can't make it alone. We all need help, support, and growth producing relationships to succeed. It wasn't just sexual empowerment I saw at work in these clinics. It was also relational and institutional support and co connection that empowered. Patients' growth would not have happened without the Title X program, increasing the social justice in lives previously lacking a fair share of resources. Without federally funded community efforts to expand social justice, without political will to intervene when help is needed, Without dedicated and relational staff at the clinic, even the power of the erotic does not have a chance. When social efforts expand freedom, equality, and the common good, which then combines with individual creativity, genius, and self-efficacy as witnessed in Title X family planning clinics, everybody wins. The lesson I learned being part of the Title X effort warns me that if we stay as divided as our nation is today, we'll, we all are going to incur huge losses. Offering authentic connection, we have to reach across all the aisles we face as best we can for the sake of maintaining and expanding social justice, equality, freedom, and common good. Because there is no sexual health or any health without social justice. So experience two, my, my Washington University undergrads. Teaching undergraduates in Washington University's Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies classes for 13 years provided me a second experience that really transformed my relationship with sexual health and social justice, a quite different one from the one I just described. What I learned during this work, which included grading a couple of thousand students' sexual history papers, was that young people are routinely denied their human rights to sexual development, to adequate sexual education, to accessible clinical services, to freedom to make sexual choices, and to the right to live in the environments that affirm and promote their sexual health and gender identifications, which constitutes an egregious reduction of social justice in their lives. The rights I just listed above are all human rights, the World Health Organization, the World Association for Sexual Health, and other leaders in sexual health care affirm for all people. The, this theft of young people's social justice resulted and continues to result in horizontal aggression among our young people themselves. Sexual assault, abuse and rape on campuses are examples of the injustices young people enact with each other that directly flow from adults' domination of them. Not only is there not sexual health without social justice, but sexual predation thrives when cultures do not maintain expect social justice for all people. Students' journals, discussions in class, and sexual history papers have made it clear to me that both parental sex education and school sex education have failed young people terribly to the point of making them sexually destructive of other sexual health as well as their own. Shaming, information, homophobic and transphobic slurs, sexual disgust, sexism, 
racism, ableism, lies, fear mongering, gender stereotyping, stigmatizations, and sometimes even violence appear too often in sex education at home and in schools. Not that wonderful family and school educators don't exist. My gosh, they do. But we should all be wonderful family or, sec or school sexuality educators. But the majority of young people don't have the privilege of learning for these folks. You know, our St. Louis school system doesn't even have a sex education program. So here are some of the experiences and problems that touch me teaching this class. So that's as, that's as explicit as we get. Uh, I don't know if you can see the whole thing, but a particularly critical area of neglect I saw in young people's sexual education was ignorance of female anatomy and physiology. Women identifying students come to Washington U educa educated about their reproductive organs, which you see, on, but not about their organs of arousal, which you see there on your right. Many are mystified about how their bodies work. Some have never heard they have a clitoral system that exists solely for their sexual pleasure. Survey students design and complete as part of their class activities reveal that at least 80% of them do not know how to orgasm with partners and do not know that penetration does not trigger orgasm in most people with vulvas. In order to seem normal in heterosexual relationships, however, they fake climaxing and pretend that they want the same things their male identifying partners want. But the clitoris is a system made up of the glands, the crura, and the clitoral balls, which you can see, uh, we have the picture on the right, what we have is a flaccid, not excited clitoral system, and then we have an erect and excited clitoral system next to it, to the right. I sort of wonder why parents and schools pro can't provide user's manuals to go with sex education. Adults' failure to make clear what functional mutual stimulation looks like has given rise to almost universal, I mean, I, it's sort of an, ex, uh, an exaggeration to call it this, but I think this is what it is, sexual dysfunction among young people. They don't know how to have pleasure. Another area of neglect is pornography. One student asked for help, came into my office, asked for help. Uh, he asked me to refer him to a sex therapist who could help him feel pleasure. And I said, well, I sure could. And then he said, his problem was that when he ejaculated on his girlfriend's face, that it, he didn't really like it. He explained that porn had taught him how most men do express their love and passion in this way. And he felt terrible that he couldn't um, do this. Um, this was his first relationship. What a sad way to start out and what sad evidence of adult abandonment of their, of young people's response, of, of adults' responsibilities to teach younger generations the basics of maturing sexually. Here's another story, it might be triggering. But family sex education needs serious attention. This student tells me stories about how he fears he will never be able to heal the rupture, now like about 10 years old, and he will feel forever alienated from his father and brother. As a younger teen, he was alarmed about what shot out of his penis when he was rubbing it to make it feel good. He ran into his father's room to show him what had happened. He thought he needed a doctor, maybe an ambulance. He just couldn't imagine what was wrong with him. His father stood up and slapped him in the face and demanded he never talk to him about such things again. The student then went to his older brother for help and got the same treatment. Deborah Rothman, a noted sex educator writes, quote, America's young people are not thriving when it comes to issues of sex, intimacy and gender. Many of them are seriously, even dangerously at risk. Many lack the resources they need to manage and enjoy their emerging sexuality in healthy ways. Although Debbie's assessment was published eight years ago, little has changed in sexual health circles. Um, they still don't center the needs of children, adolescents, and emerging adults in ways that will enable them to unfold unproblematically into sexually mature, satisfied adults. 
to show you how challenging the situation is. SICUS, which has always been seen as a revolutionary organization, SICUS's 2020 National Standards for Sex Education, published to provide a template to guide schools across the nation in their sex ed planning, really ignores sexual pleasure in its curriculum. Data shows how highly young people prioritize sexual pleasure and how often they ask to be featured, ask for it for pleasure to be featured in their sex education classes. Nevertheless, the word pleasure appears only nine times in this 69 page manual. Penis appears only five times and clitoris does not appear at all. In another SICUS report, which revises Texas's national sex ed standards, the words pleasure, penis, and clitoris never appear. One can only conclude that much sexual education today is designed to allay adult discomfort rather than respond to young people's developmentally appropriate curiosity. In each class I teach, students always put together a survey of questions. They want to hear the answers from their peers. So one question they frequently ask is, where have you learned most of what you know about sex? Not surprisingly, given that was the point of the class, many answered in this class. In 13 years of teaching, I only had a few say from my parents. It's sad to hear their answer to the next question too. The next question is, where do you wish you had heard most of what you know? And the question is, and the answer is, from my parents. And yet parents say that they get shot down when they try to talk to their children about sex. There are some ways of doing this better than others. Are parents studying their options? Are we using a convenient excuse to avoid our own discomfort? While well, lots of sexuality educators point out sex is good for teens and list many benefits, our society does not provide the institutions young people need to develop sexually, ethically, physically, spiritually. Young people need support of their sexual development. They need honest conversations about sex, especially about mutual sexual pleasure. They need access to free contraceptive and reproductive services. They need non-judgmental sexual mentoring. It's not surprising that many students tell stories of non-consensual sex, sexual bullying, fat phobic com comments, peer spying and recording their sexual activities, violence, and more. One tells about a fraternity member who physically tossed her, someone he didn't like because she stood up to him, from the top of the stairs leading down from the fraternity house's front door. I was involved in that case and like the survivor was shocked the perpetrator escaped without penalty or rehabilitation. Oppression breeds oppression. How adults treat students sets the pattern for how the students treat each other. Sexual health requires social justice mentoring. But adultism persists. The view of adults is that they know what is best for younger people. And this deprives young people of their human rights to get answers to the questions they care about. If a topic or question makes adults uncomfortable, even though young people request learning about the topic, it is sidelined in too many sex ed curricula, like it is um, for SICUS. Rather than provide sex ed education that instructs young people how to have pleasurable sex, and what makes for intimate relationships, the older generation gives young people harm reduction lessons and little more. The bottom line is none of the young people I taught had access to all of their, their human rights. For some adults in their lives, parents, teachers, sex ed instructors expected them to abstain not only from sexual intercourse, but also from all sexual activity, sexual fantasy, and even sexual desire. Sexual development is normative. We just, that's, that's human. To prohibit it prevent, uh, represents a form of child sexual abuse in my view. Young people need more social justice, rights and freedom 
if they are to experience the sexual health that will benefit them for the rest of their lives. Now for my third transformative experience of relations of sexual health and social justice, ASECT. So I recently finished my term as president of ASECT, an organ, a wonderful organization that credentials sexual educators, counselors, and therapists nationally. While a sexuality educator, I am also a social worker, a professional whose training involves weaving social justice into every aspect of their work. So you can understand my dismay where in the middle of my term, a few members of the organization protested the theme of my presidency on our listserv. Do you think ASEC's president should be saying there's no sexual health without social justice? They asked. That's not our policy, some argued. Nevertheless, um, let's say, I'm just gonna skip down a little bit. Uh, so actually ASEC, uh, that is our policy. Um, but it seems here that what was left out of the conversation also were recent articles written by um, previous ASEC President Debbie Herbenek on high rates of sexual assault and har harassment of young sexuality professional women by sexuality professional men. So the threat of ASEC threatens sexual privilege of others. Although the majority of ASEC members advocate for more social justice in our organization, not less, I wanted to be, you know, a president responsive to everyone. But I had always assumed sex without social justice was rape or close to it. Perhaps if a person has all the social justice they need, however, having sex without noticing the status of social justice in the interaction is a privilege preferred over organizational social justice. So Here's what I took away from this scenario. I think it exposes the high rates of polarization in our country. We have far to go before we can claim having a united culture of consent. Nevertheless, my experience at ASECT and with sexuality educators, counselors and therapists there gave me faith that a future best practice will build on the power of social justice to increase sexual satisfaction and pleasure. It will also acknowledge the degree to which oppression harms the sexual health of oppressors as well as those they target. Humans are wired to connect and when they regularly pursue disconnection, they experience stress. Over time, they will probably develop a general adaptation syndrome. This is something that depletes their bodies of hormones, leads to major illnesses and can shorten life. Oppression creates bad health in every way. So I'm convinced more than ever that sexual health cannot exist without social justice. And we as a people will eventually come together to expand both together. So sex exceptionalism, silence is talking about sex. It's really hard for us to you know, to repair things and to talk to people, to talk to children, to talk to students, to talk to each other about what we're really feeling about sex. So we experience sex exceptionalism, like sex is something different than everything else in our world. Anthropologists and postmodern theorists explain the Im that images of sexuality are overdetermined in many human societies because sex is experienced so personally and feels so natural humans in some societies read their society's predominant images of sex as direct images of the natural order. So how we have sex, that's natural. As such, they become, these images of sex become templates that can stamp their naturalness on other socially constructed arrangements. And so trick people into seeing these latter arrangements also as natural, also to be accepted. So in Western patriarchal societies like our own, predominant images of sex feature male priorities and buttress male privilege. Natural sex is always shown as heterosexual and it shows the person with the penis initiating, he is on top, enjoying what we know to be 40% more orgasms than partners with vulvas. They're on the bottom having much less fun. The ubiquity and naturalness of dominant male protagonists demonstrating dominating cis het missionary position sex help to naturalize other gendered advantages that they have. This looks like 
gendered pay gaps, gender de data gaps, leadership gaps, and domestic labor gaps. When, these, when this kind of sex seems normal, unremarkable, and unactionable, if people are always on the top, they should always be on the top. We're never going to have social justice. Other intersec intersections imaged in conventional representation of sex and patriarchal capitalistic societies argue for seeing other subordinations in society also as natural. Sexualized pictures of black folks in animal skin serve to imply and condemn black sexuality as more animalist animalistic than that of whites. The sexual innocentizing of children argues for denying them adequate sex education and permission to explore their bodies in accordance with needs for experiences that support their sexual development. Don't they know that people masturbate in the womb? Young people in the US have fewer rights than uh, young people in similarly industrialized nations were really the worst. Audre Lorde and postmodern French philosopher Michel Foucault warn our bodies are being colonized to make us more docile. That's what's happening here. Lorde writes, in order to perpetuate itself, every oppression must corrupt or distort those various sources of power within the culture of the oppressed that can provide energy for change. And that means a supp suppression of the erotic as a source of power and information within our lives. This is why she says we have been taught to suspect this resource vilified, abused, and devalued within Western society. Michel Foucault theorizes that what is happening is governance by biopower, what he calls biopower. So mass society is too large and complex to govern through sovereign power, like having one tyrant have adopted a new mode of ruling by getting people to internalize dominant social expectations, which then police them from the inside. That's called biopower. Foucault sees sexuality as the principal tool of biopower. By problematizing and hystericalizing sexual nonconformity, people anxiously conform to dominant sex gender norms. Docile bodies are not as apt to rise up and resist as those who embrace what Audre Lorde calls the erotic. The, doc, the people who are docile go along with the status quo. So if personal sex is also this political sex, how we feel about sex is really confounded. Most people do not know how to talk about it. There seems to be a disconnect between how we feel and how we think we should act. 56% of clients consulting with us bring sexual questions at the top of their list of symptoms and complaints. They want help with those first, but only 15% of our practitioners even ask their clients about their sexual health. Interventions that could empower these clients sexually are thus foregone and so are opportunities for expanding social justice. Like you, I am social aware. I, I, like you, I am super aware there is an enormous taboo uh, forbidding talking about sex. Implicit and in sexual etiquette is the message that you will figure out when you need to, is the message we get. But that path leads to Lots of people in my class will describe their wedding night is laying inertly on their bridal bed, waiting for the magic to wash over them. Only discovered that the vaunted event felt like, well, nothing. Where's the beef, one asks. There must be something wrong with me, another asks. I'm feeling nothing, someone else says. They've all had abstinent ed education and have been perfect students. They now regret having missed opportunities, now unrecoverable to experience sex and develop sexual selves at more appropriate points in their lives. So that we have interventions to prompt fact, frank discussion of sexual health. To address non-medical sexual problems or concerns, um, we have these at the, at the Brown School that we have, I teach in all my classes. I uh, created an intervention called the Sex Chat, which involves around four hours of conversations using sexual genograms, sexual timelines, sexual eco -nap maps and the sexual self-efficacy scale. We have brochures, you can see them here, that help students figure out how to, how to uh, give all of these, talk about all of these tools. The most important in intervention, however, uh, is how we talk to each other as adults and mutual friends, not as experts or teachers or shamers, as the person pictured here seems to understand her job. The voice of the adult is dialogic and integrates pleasure 
um, and danger or risks. They both come together. The voice is fair and respectful. It's curious and friendly. It's non-judgmental. This is the voice of the transformative sexuality educator. This is the person who helps us explore how we got to be the way we are sexually and how we would like to perhaps be. To pick and choose among our cultural and family scripts for the ones we really would like to hang on to and the ones we would really like to get rid of. The tool I wanna to share with you today is the Plicit model, which teaches us how to structure our sexual conversations to make them mutual conversations, to keep our relationship with our client consensual. We all, always want to model consent because that is the center of ethical erotics. Sex worth happy, having delights all participants and that takes enthusiastic consent. So the Plicit model, as you can see here, begins with permission. We always ask permission. I should have asked you today, is it okay, everybody, if I talk to you about sex? If people say no, we don't go any further. The permission lets the interviewing know why you want to talk about their sex. Using an adult voice, you might say, Mary, we think sexual health is an important part of your total health. Would it be okay if we included discussions about sexuality when we talk today? We don't just jump in with questions that demand answers because that communicates that we feel in charge and that we're superior and have the right to question and demand their answers. Using the Plicit model, we avoid intrusiveness, establish mutuality and treat the interviewee as the expert of their own life. Now the next two levels, limited information and, and specific suggestions uh, come from the client. So the client might say, I'm not having pleasure with intercourse. So you give limited information. Do you know that you belong to a group of women who don't orgasm during penetration? 80% of us don't. And then a specific suggestion. Do you get pleasure when you have sex with yourself? Clitoris is. Here's the internal clitoris. It's a whole system, not just a small button. They're crura, clitoral bulbs, erectile tissue. Until the bulbs become as engorged as a penis, an orgasm is not gonna happen. Uh, ask her, have you ever masturbated? How about using a vibrator, reading erotica? Uh, share with her your, those are vulva puppets. Share with her your vulva puppets. Show her the chart there of what a clitoris looks like. Let her feel in the vulva puppets what an aroused clitoral bulb feels like. Uh, they have them um, in there so you can find them so that you can feel in yourself if you have one. Ask her if she's ever used the tub or showers for, for sexual pleasure. When you want to go to a new topic, start over at the permission level. So is it okay if I switch over to the sexual self-efficacy survey now? It is a validated tool that enables you to see your sexual strengths and challenges for each of four domains. Um, and it's uh, the domains are pleasure, power, protection, and intimacy. So, uh, sexual self-efficacy is conceptualized this way and uh, we can score it and you can see exactly what your sexual self looks like and what areas you're challenged in and what areas you're gifted in. So, I have these questions and I'm going to send um, with, with Janet to put wherever she puts stuff that we're going to keep um, a sexual self-efficacy scale for you and you can take it. And you, these are sort of the questions. Um, and so as I finish here, I just want to share an evaluation of one of my students I thought was particularly beautiful. So the first picture she drew was herself before. Um, she had sex education at the Brown School. She felt isolated and depressed. And the second one is after she had her sex chats. She felt empowered, magical, and beautiful. So I wanna thank you for listening to me, celebrate, and now we'll take some time for questions. Susan, thank you so much for a very, very enlightening presentation this afternoon. We do have a more than a couple of questions for you. The first one is, is one around resources for talking to teens about sex. Is this something that you can recommend? Um, wait a minute, I was just um, getting off my thing. Okay, Re uh, recommendations for teens? Yes, for, for resources to talk to teens about sex. 
Wow, mm -hmm. there are so many. I would go to the Center for Sex Education. They have a whole library of those. Um, there are some wonderful websites and, and listservs that you can go on. Seekus actually is, is, is usually very good. Um, I'll, I have a whole bibliography for young people and I'll put that in with the information that I leave, but there, there's a ton of information out there and ASECT has wonderful sex educators. You can also contact and have come and talk to your school. They could come and meet with your family. Uh, they often give trainings on how to talk to you. One of the things is education. And so on when they, right before vacation, I tell them to take your favorite paper that you read in this class and teach it to your parent. Um, so that is another good thing. Ask your children to teach you about sex. What is sex now? Like now, I'm so sort of out of it. I don't even know what the sex scene looks like. Okay. The next question in the chat uh, comes from Capri. She asks, I think as parents, we are not sure we know what's right or wrong about sex. If we have been having unpleasurable sex, how do we know that we are giving the right information? It would only be from our own experience, which could not always be the right way. Rented conversations come in and that's what we don't like to have. That's what's so hard. Um, I like to tell my children, my, you know, the mistake But, you know, you could tell your children that you really never figured out sex and you don't know why. And you hope maybe together you can have a, a family sex education course and explore uh, the many books, the many pamphlets, the many films. Um, there is a great film I want to recommend right now. <clears throat> it's really short, five minutes. And it's by Chan, C-H-A-N, and it's called Jamming, J-A-M-M-I-N-G. It's fabulous. And it compares sex to improvisation and jazz. And I think you really enjoy it. Watch that with your kids, have a conversation, be open. Um, the hardest thing is to, you know, to fake it, to lie. So however you can be intimate with your children and talk honestly about the problem of sex in America, best. Okay. Susan, another question has to do with the story that you told about the 10-year-old boy who experienced arousal and ejaculation. Do you feel that his mother might have responded differently than his father and brother? Well, if his mother had been me, yes. <laughs> I don't know. I think all of us have such, we haven't had good sex education. So anyone could, I don't think, I don't know. I hope the mother wouldn't have struck him. But I guess your question is, do you think women are better sex educators? No, no. I think we all have problems being sex educators. And I think we need each other um, talking to our friends about it, talking you know, to everybody. One, one of the things my students always say is, you know, now I'm always talking about sex now that I've taken this class. And it kind of has to be that way, that if we could talk with our friends better, with with other people better, um, we could talk with our children better. Yeah, we, we, this is just a problem we have. I think that 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 story is emblematic for all of us. Thank you, Susan. Here's one that I got in, in privately to me. Does a man go through menopause? Well, you'd have to really ask a man what that even is. You know, women, uh, people who menstruate, um, stop menstruating and all of us kind of describe it really differently. So when I went through menopause, I didn't have hot flashes. I had power surges. I loved it. So I don't, I can't really answer that question for you. I think that we all, all of us have our sexuality changing across the life course. How we have sex at 25 is now how we have it at 40, not how we have it at 80. But sex is important right up to the death room, to the to the dying, the die, the end, the dying end. 
And we just have to figure out how to change it as we go along. Okay. So menopause, I guess we have, you know, we have, we have so many changes. Menopause might be just one of them. Okay. Susan, would you please uh, uh, briefly expound on the united culture of consent? What did you mean by that? Well, what I mean is that in our, in our society, in America, every one of us believes that consent is the way to run our lives. Like, I'm a grandmother. I don't just hug my grandchildren. I ask them, can I give you a hug? Sometimes they say, ooh, no. I don't do it. Um, there was a, a story I was writing, reading recently about a sex worker. And she was complaining about the lack of consent where she was doing um, some porn. She was a star in a, a porn movie. And people thought that they could touch her anytime because this is what she did. No, that sh she needs, she she needs to be able to give consent to. So the idea that all of us, and it seems to me as I watch po politics, I'm thinking, why aren't we talking about some things like this? Why aren't we talking about, you know, the fact that people are like, I mean, we just sort of are like, we're not, we're just letting it go. And consent is so important. And until we, I mean, that's what democracy is built on. And that's why social justice is so important because we have to be able to consent. Thank you, Susan. There was a question about a statement that you made about, I'm not sure how to phrase this, but the child or the person masturbates in the womb. Could you oh, yeah. expound on that? Yes, yeah, so there are pictures of a very well-defined, uh, you know, pretty late fetus and he's, he's masturbating in the womb. And so there's a lot of pleasure. They even think that little, that fetuses grow certain hairs all over their bodies to give them pleasure as the, the um, water flows over them. So pleasure is so important from the beginning of our lives right to the end. The last sense that we lose as we die is our sense of touch. So yeah, that's, I can give you the uh, pictures of that if you ask. Okay, this is the next to last question that I have given the late hour. Sarah asks, I have had many men tell me that their sexual desires are uncontrollable. Do you feel that this is true? Or do you feel that this is a self-fulfilling prophecy in our society? I think it's a line. <laughs> of course, everybody can control their sexual impulses please. However, you know, some people have so much privilege, it's never occurred to them to do that. So mm -hmm. it's a matter of privilege. You notice how people have very little privilege, um, not, you know, control things a lot more severely. So yeah, sorry about that. Mm -hmm. That should have, I'm sure, sorry that happened to you. Thank you so much, Susan. This has been so enlightening and fun. I'm going to turn it over to my co-moderator, Janet. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Good Welcome. to see you. You too. Thanks, Cynthia. And thanks, Susan. We are at time. This always happens that we make an hour go by so quickly. And there are so many great questions in the chat. We're sorry we didn't get a chance to get to all of them. But Susan, before we, we say goodbye and, and wish everybody well, I just wanted to give you a um, last chance to provide a closing thought or a, a comment, anything that you'd like to send everybody out on. Wow. Um, you know, there is something I want to send you out on. If I can find this in, well, I'll just try and remember it. I want you to have zest, good feelings about yourself, a sense of excitement and productivity and a desire to connect with all of us and for the new year that's coming up and forever. Those are the five good things that the relational cultural their theorists tell us, and I can't imagine anything better to live a life in that way. What a blessing to send people out on. Thank you for that. Lots of love for you in the chat. People saying, you know, great job and great information. So thank you for, for sharing your expertise, your experiences, your thoughts with us. 
audience, thank you for fantastic questions and for you know just being part of this wonderful supportive learning community that we've assembled virtually. To my co-host, Cynthia, thank you so much for making this easy um, to get everybody together. And we hope to see you all very soon. Please stay healthy and safe out there right now, everybody. Um, catch you soon. Goodbye. Thank you, Susan. Bye.